already planned before we pack today that we have already for you. And uh, because it is so tightly packed, uh, there is very little room for delay. I apologize up front for making it, uh, you know, pushing you guys in while the people are still trickling. You know. um, <clears throat> this is fourth year in a row. We have been organizing this uh, epic workshop and uh, must have received a ton of emails from Professor uh, Nanda Kumar about uh, our epic effort. So thank you for uh, supporting us by being over here. And, uh, Today's program, if I were to put it all together, we are going to have welcome remarks from our uh, senior administration and uh, then followed by a summary of our uh, last year's work from Kumar. A couple of keynote talks, uh, we'll uh, announce about those, uh, one from uh, Top Notch Academy and uh, also from industry, followed up by some uh, researchers uh, talking from industry talking about uh, how they use uh, simulations for their research. And uh, as a part of a unique experiment this year, we have a CD at Apple running hands-on tutorial on how to use the context of the pandemics uh, for industry-scale problems. With that, I think we would like to acknowledge lots of our sponsors, without which this uh, consortium and things would not have been where they are. Uh, in particular, uh, tremendous support from uh, OREC, as well as College of Engineering and CCT. Uh, at LSU, and uh, a lot of industrial support. Uh, this year's uh, uh, all the uh, lunch and coffees have been sponsored by CBA and Apple, as well as they are going to do hands on tutorials. Um, and our industry members, the first year industry members will uh, be uh, Borealis and Albomar. Albomar has been generous to actually send us uh, a couple of uh, projects. So, <coughs> While we, while we continue to, uh, talking about uh, how, how the program will go, let me tell you that uh, this year we have actually been able to do the Kumar was the key person there to organize this uh, conference in uh, Van, where we had uh, a lot of our past speakers that we have brought over to the Epic Seminar Series. Epic Seminar Series has been a kind of our uh, uh, key uh, I would call it as the one of the key steps that help us formulate, rethink, and rehash this idea about how to formulate a consortium over the period of time. And it has involved like some members, like uh, any member, like Andre Prosperity, now he's a senior at Houston, uh, Padma Bhushan, uh, Professor J.B. Joshi uh, from Homi Baba Research Institute at India, a lot of top dignitaries all around the world. And truly, uh, what started at LSU has now taken up an international shape. So we are hoping that in two years from from 2016, 2018, there will be another international workshop around EPIC. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Rick Quebec to welcome you guys <coughs> for our fourth annual workshop on EPIC. Rick? I can tell you this picture is truly a delight for me because it was probably about five years ago when my uncle Nanda Kumar came when I was the Dean of Engineering and talked about this idea of process intensification. And my background is discrete parts manufacturing, spending most of my life in the manufacturing world at the Big Ten. And I lived through the processes of you know, flexible manufacturing and lights out factories and Toyota production systems. And I saw the impact that that had on the discrete parts manufacturing groups that I used to be involved in. And when they described the idea of process intensification for the chemical industry, it was really exciting. But where that was going to go, we had no idea, except two gentlemen had, an, had a thought of what if we were able to create a center and grow that and make it not just US based, but internationally based. And I can tell you when we first started the first year or so, it was a little bumpy trying to get off the ground, but they persevered and they found the key in my opinion. And the key was that this is a unique partnership with academia and industry to improve the quality of life by improving the processes in the chemical industry. And from that, when I turned, when I was sitting in the audience and saw this slide, it's really a great milestone, in my opinion, of where you all have brought it. And on behalf of Louisiana State University, for which the chemical industry is fundamental to our economy, I so much appreciate being here and having these discussions, especially to our keynote speakers, which we'll talk today. Thank you so much for joining us. So thank you all. I would also like to invite uh, uh, VP uh, Office of Research and
and Economic Development, Professor Kevin Walters, to come and give a few welcome remarks to our audience. I'm really delighted to be here to uh, welcome you all. It was many years ago when I was department chair that Kumar came to me and said he has this idea of uh, um, forming this consortium. And uh, of course, the first question I ha asked was, well, you can do it in the department, but what good is it for the university? And it was very easy for me to see where this was leading up because fluid dynamics as a whole is not just a chemical engineering perspective, it involves everything else in the engineering discipline. So the seeded idea that Kumar and uh, Mike has brought about is now much more nationally recognized. And uh, you will hear shortly from Arthur the idea of EPICS was the seed for what has now become uh, uh, an initiative towards a manufacturing institute. Hopefully if we come to that, it would really tell me that a very simple idea that some, uh, someone thought about has now become much more recognized nationally <coughs> and also of use and utility to the industry that is around here. Of course, chemical industry is the backbone of Louisiana's economy. Uh, we wouldn't exist <coughs> as a state pretty much if we, we didn't have that industry here. Of course, there are other uh, agricultural industries and others which also form a, a, a major part of our uh, economy. Ideas like these reinvigorate those industries. As you all know, the chemical industry is a very conservative industry. It doesn't really change a whole lot very quickly. But you have to seed certain ideas and make it grow, and then it becomes even more important for the rest of the community. So this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity. It's the fourth time that I'm addressing this uh, group. And uh, as usual, this is Thanksgiving weekend. So I, I'm sure that some of the students are have escaped already, so, so so the attendance may be a little bit of a problem when you hold it just two days before uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Anyway, I welcome you all, and uh, of course I'm looking forward to some of the talks here. So, thank you. Next, I would like to welcome Interim Dean uh, for College of Engineering, Professor Judy Warnack, another chemical engineer, and she has been a constant support for our EPIC related efforts, especially during the EPIC seminar series, and help us bring in the top notch international reviewed uh, researchers on LSU campus. So please welcome Professor Judy Warnack. Well, thanks very much, Mayanka, and I do want to extend my welcome from the LSU College of Engineering. Uh, indeed, when we look at this slide, we can see that the fruits of the activities of EPIC really do go far and wide. But if we consider just right here on campus at LSU, from my perspective, the whole theme of innovation in EPIC has really hit resonance through our faculty in the College of Engineering. I just wanted to share with you a couple of examples of that. One of them is sitting right here to my left. Do you know that many of the faculty in the College of Engineering are more and more taking advantage of the opportunity to take their creative ideas and their innovations and transform them, transform them into those next steps of getting patents and then eventually <coughs> technology commercialization? Well, a, a, few, a few months ago, uh, Brian Shedd, the Assistant Director at LSU's Office of Innovation and Technology Commercialization, approached me and said, what if I set up an office in the LSU College of Engineering so that when faculty are interested in exploring these kinds of opportunities, I'll be right there available and maybe it will help to spark more of that. And sure enough, now a couple of days a week in Patrick Taylor Hall, LSU's College of Engineering main building in the newly renovated park, Ryan Shedd is, is offering office hours two days a week to our faculty so that they can help to explore those types of options and eventually lead to actual companies that might be uh, fruits of some of the creative ideas of our faculty. A second example is having to do with a lot of our research. You might notice that more and more of the research grants coming into the College of Engineering have the word innovation in them, 
And a prime example is the Consortium for Innovation and in Manufacturing of Materials. That is a $20 million five-year grant where LSU College of Engineering, Mechanical and Industrial Engineering faculty took the lead in joining hands with uh, <coughs> researchers from other, other universities in, in <coughs> Louisiana, as well as the National Center for Advanced Manufacturing and the Louisiana Alliance for Simulation Guided <coughs> Materials Applications. They had a successful effort to the National Science Foundation, got this grant through the Board of Regents, and the result of that is a five-year effort in order to advance applications in 3D metal printing and multi-scale metal forming. So those are just two examples in which I'm seeing that whole concept of innovation flourish within the LSU College of Engineering. And I think a lot of this blossoming that's going on is because many of the seeds for innovation that Kumar and others in the room set quite a few years ago. So we have a very interesting program. I think we'll probably be hearing from Wen Jinming, one of the leaders in that consortium effort. And I'm looking forward to learning a few things too. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. support from College of Engineering as well as uh, all our senior administrators. Next in line, we have uh, a welcome remark from uh, Arthur Cooper. He is the CEO for Exim Coalition and uh, also uh, uh, what is the title of uh, Director of the Foundation? Uh, I'm the CEO of the <laughs> Research Foundation. And Arthur was DPI for our NMI efforts. So, Arthur? Yeah. Well, good morning. Uh, yeah, my, my day job is with the LSU Research and Technology Foundation. And, you know, our real focus is trying to commercialize the technology that comes out of the LSU Research campus. So we're, we're that nexus between, uh, you know, university research and commercial applications. Uh, but I was asked today to give you a little bit of an update on another role that I've been playing, and that is uh, uh, helping LSU respond to a FOA. Back in May, the Department of Energy put out a call for the establishment of a national network for modular chemical process uh, And it had a very aggressive schedule. Uh, it was uh, released on May 3rd. The concept paper was due on June 15th, with a full proposal due on August 17th, and a oral presentation on October 13th. Speak, we are waiting to hear uh, based on that. But to the credit of LSU and the University of Houston, they put together a tremendous team uh, to help respond to that. And I'm kind of a cautionary tale to be careful when the provost calls you and asks you to help. Because uh, it was really the idea that we were going to organize a nonprofit to respond to this, and so I was asked to help with that. And lo and behold, I've become the chief operating officer and the executive director of the institute, which is now being referred to as the Process, Sophistication, and Innovation Institute, or PIP. Uh, so, uh, and its real, you know, idea is, was formed with two principles. One, we're a, member, we're a membership network, and uh, we formed uh, the organization called the Axiom Coalition. And uh, we want to deliver really good value to our members. And how we do that is through the funding that we will receive is to pick out the best high quality research that we can find. I mean, one of the things that you, you see in a lot of these grants is they tend to be geared around a particular institute, a particular person, a particular lab. But what we were found was principle that the best will rise to the top. That we will have a competitive institute that will fund uh, the best research and do it on an annual basis. And so uh, we will have an annual call uh, for modular chemical process identification and try to pick the best research and, and fund that research. Uh, owing to the strength of what else you did, we put together uh, a very strong uh, cost share. Uh, the state of Louisiana participated, the University of Houston, LSU, we really, really came to the table in this grant. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're really excited about the, the possibility. But it's also uniquely organized. 
in the sense that the Action Coalition will be headquartered in the building right behind us, uh, which is the Louisiana Emerging Technology Center. But it'll have seven regional operations units around the country. We have uh, the University of Houston and, and then LSU, but we also have um, UC Santa Barbara. We have the Colorado School of Mines and the NRL, Oregon National Labs, University of Kansas, and then the City College of New York. And, and why we're organized that way is to have a natural institute that still has a local and regional feel. Uh, so that members uh, you know, have local access to, to, to partners of the institute. Also, each one of those regional operations units will focus on some technical area. And for me, I, my background is actually electrical engineering, so I, I'm kind of late to it. I told them when they, when they asked me, I said, look, I had to take chemistry since 1976, so, you know, <laughs> I, may, I may not bring a lot of technical strength to it, but, you know, really corporate formation is what I've worked in for, for a long time. Uh, but what struck me when we had our first workshop, the first workshop that I attended in Houston, was really the need for computation. You know, how, you know, I, I walked into it thinking we're going to, we're going to, we're going to redesign this distillation columns. You know, that's what, I mean, my mindset is, you know, that's with it. But really, when you looked at it, and I went through this, uh, the, uh, the workshop, how important computation was and virtual test beds were going to be to advancing. It was really the, the fundamental of how we were going to advance chemical process and distribution. So, uh, and it, it, it kind of got lost in the market piece. But one of the things I really liked, somebody said we needed to create the virtual chemical engineer. And although I know that's a technical impossibility, but the idea that that the Institute would deliver tools that will help advance uh, chemical process much faster than it could ever occur under the, the current um, method of design it was really exciting. So we're, we've got our fingers crossed, we're very hopeful, but even if it would go to the other team, the idea that the government and organizations are focusing in this area I think is really important and I think LSU will, will uh, University Houston, all the team players will play a role no matter what. And so we welcome you here today and I hope you all have a good day for you. Thank you, Arthur. From my personal alert, I think that's the largest dollar amount proposal I was ever part of, though I had a very small part to do with it. <laughs> but that small part probably is bigger than all my research career, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, next, I would like to welcome, uh, is Andy Massey or you're going to be? Uh, so, Brian Sheck will represent the Office of Intellectual Property as uh, uh, Professor Gordon attended to. Uh, Brian, do you have some words for our audience from Office of Intellectual Property? Definitely, yeah, and Andrew's in the regards. Good to be here today. Um, so, I've uh, only been here at LSU for about a year. Uh, I'm, I'm from Baton Rouge, so I've been a football fan for much longer than that, even after this weekend. Um, but, yeah, well, the Tigers. Um, but uh, one of the things I was brought here to do uh, was to improve our intellectual property capabilities. Um, so I've, I've been doing technology transfer for almost 10 years now, and this is something all universities struggle with, and something we get, um, you know, we get hit on every time with, with companies is just how difficult it can sometimes be uh, to work through research contracts and to negotiate things like intellectual property terms with universities. And so that's one thing that we're doing, um, you know, we're, we're taking head on to try and improve upon. And I thought I'd just take a few moments and talk about some of the efforts that we're, we're, we're doing uh, in that area. Um, so one thing that we often get bogged down with are access to intellectual property rights in research contracts. So we've worked out with the Office of Sponsored Programs, kind of like an a la carte menu now. So when companies come in, and they need certain access to intellectual property rights on the back end of a research contract, we've got pre-negotiated terms now. So those contracts are going to be much easier to get into. Um, so that's one way that we can kind of expedite that process and also be very upfront and transparent about the rights that we can provide to intellectual property. Um, one of the other ways, um, you know, it's very fitting that we're here in, in the DMC. Um, we're, we're trying to improve uh, the work that we do with groups like CCT, um, that are very software heavy. Um, these are often times some of the most challenging areas to work um, because copyright ownership and access is, is much more complex than I think what patent can be uh, when it comes to intellectual property. Um, and so we are actually trying to improve the ways that we can provide access to software. 
Um, we are limited in that. We are a state institution, and there are a lot of restrictions um, with uh, property, and intellectual property is a type of property. Um, and so we have now a waiver process so we can pre-release things like open source software um, that are going to be developed as a part of a research contract. Um, so we're hoping, again, this is one of those ways that we can kind of speed up the process. If open source is something that's required in a, in a, in a research collaboration, we can now provide access to that open source and, and a pathway for that open source software to be released uh, before it's even developed. Um, so that's kind of another way that, that we're working to, to improve the process with, with industry um, and, and just the robustness of our collaborations. Um, I'd also like to plug, we just um, signed on to be the administrator for the LSU Apple Store uh, developer account and the iTunes Connect account. Um, so this is very new. Uh, this, this only happened in the last few weeks. Um, but now, if you would like to release an app here on campus, uh, we can do that through an LSU-branded Apple storefront. Um, and so if, 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 anything, if, if, if anything that I'm talking about right now sounds like something that, that you might need help with, um, please come and find me, like Dean Warnett mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm having office hours now two days a week in engineering. Um, engineering actually accounts for uh, half of our invention disclosures <coughs> every year. Um, so that's, you know, it's a stronghold for the innovation and in intellectual property development that we're seeing here on campus. Um, and I certainly welcome everybody to come and talk to me, uh, faculty, staff, students, the community, uh, industry, collaborators. Um, if there are questions about how to protect intellectual property that's being developed in research projects, I'd be happy to have those conversations. Um, we're certainly seeing a lot of increase in the intellectual property output. And we're hoping and trying to encourage that to translate into more successful commercialization outcomes. Um, so whether that's through startup companies or licensing to existing companies, um, we're open for business. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to talking with you all further. Thank you, Brian. Uh, with all the remarks, I hope all positive. Uh, and the message very loud and clear to the industry. And we are open for business. And uh, uh, what we would like to do is, is uh, now I would like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Nanda Kumar, Cane Chair in Chemical Engineering Department. And uh, Kumar has been uh, not only a, a tremendous colleague, inspiration, but he's <coughs> I'm proud to say that he's been my mentor on this journey, and uh, I've learned so much from Kumar, and uh, I hope other people get to share a similar experience and uh, share his ex uh, vision towards EPIC. And uh, everywhere he has been, he's always been part of solving problems that are highly relevant for industry and have societal impact. So when he, he spent his 20-something years at uh, Alberta, he was solving problems like tar sands, uh, erosion, uh, highly relevant problems. He spent two years at uh, Petroleum Institute at Abu Dhabi, and uh, he's been at uh, uh, LSU since 2009 10 uh, time frame. First thing I remember coming during the time when he was interviewing over here, tremendous speaker. Uh, uh, as a teacher, you would like to retake all those two dynamics courses that you have taken before. And uh, since 2012, he started thinking about EPIC. And uh, over these last four or five years, as uh, even uh, uh, Professor Kubek mentioned, uh, we have reshaped and we have rethought. And hopefully, we have come closer to the point where uh, it is uh, exciting for industry to come and work with us. So, this is all yours, Kumar. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. First, uh, thank Maya. Um, He's been a great friend, and uh, we came for coffee every Sunday to brainstorm ideas about this. It's a continuous process of iterating and improving. And I also should thank the outstanding support that I have received from the administrators uh, over the last uh, eight years that I have been uh, at LSU, particularly over the last uh, three or four years when we launched uh, EPIC. And there has been a kind of a move upward uh, I think Professor Valsarad, when I joined, was the chair and he became the VP of research. And uh, uh, Provost uh, Kovac was the dean. 
and he became the provost when Judy moved to be the chair, and now the dean. And throughout all this, they have been tremendously supporting uh, our vision and our concept. Um, so through this uh, effort, we have, as you saw in the picture, we have an international network of uh, people uh, like-minded and thinking about similar problems on how to impact uh, innovation uh, to pro uh, chemical process industries. And it has been a great fortune for me to be uh, offered the opportunity to invite so many of them. Today, I'm sure you're not here to talk to me because I'm going to preach the same message. Many of you may have heard this, but I'm sure you want to hear to Professor Vivek um, Ranade and uh, Dr. Philippe uh, Lego in Tokyo. And they have wonderful stories to tell as well. And Ranade, of course, I've known for a long time, but um, Dr. Rico, I just met about a month ago, and uh, such a fascinating experience. Um, so I, I can talk for an hour or so about these wonderful experiences, the scientific challenges that we discuss as we drive wherever we go. Uh, but what I want to do about in 10, 15 minutes, um, give you an idea of what we did over the last year, what has happened, what is the direction in which uh, Epic has evolved, um, and then uh, open the floor for the keynote speakers. Uh, so as Epic, uh, as uh, Arthur pointed out, we are kind of evolving into the field. And uh, my aunt is very good at coming up with these uh, nice acronyms, EPIC and PIQ. Uh, and I was fascinated with the title of PIQ also. But there are about 20 universities, 40 companies, and four national labs in our LNI effort. And some of them find it too nerdy. And it is probably too nerdy, right? So what is pi after all, right? And to me, pi is a beautiful number, okay? It's a, it's an invariant about the circle. So if you take, for example, two ants, draw a circle of any size, and ask one ant to go around the circle, the other ant to go straight through the center, and report the distances they cover, you take the ratio of one to the other, it's a constant, no matter how big the circle is. It's a beautiful number. But if you ask what is that number, you never know. The other beauty is it's infinite precision. You never, I mean, it's an irrational number, right? So if you go to the website, you find how you compute it, compute it to a million, to hundred million digits. Okay? But still we never know the truth. That's the nature, the nature's way of hiding its secrets from us in some way. Right? There are some beauty and symmetry in it, but um, there are infinite dimensional attributes to this. And that is a part of our logo that we designed about 50 years ago. Two infinite signs in LSU colors, but it also captures both fossil energy and renewable energy from the sun and water through the plants that feed the chemical industry as a feedstock. So we are interested both in using fossil fuels and renewable fuels as feedstocks <coughs> to produce chemicals for a variety of reasons. So the innovation that we are focusing is on this. Whether it is renewable or fossil feedstock, we want to innovate this section so that we produce chemicals, pharmaceuticals, agrochemicals. There's a whole range of products that uh, we can make. Uh, so, it's a journey from EPIC to PIQ through NMI that I'm going to briefly talk about. And then the research challenges, I think our uh, keynote speakers can do a much better uh, job of talking about multi-phase, multi-scale, multi-physics, nature of the processes. And we had a five-day workshop, as uh, uh, Mayan pointed out, in BAN, fo uh, focusing extensively on the detailed challenges of modeling, of algorithms, of high performance computing, etc. And uh, that will continue to remain a challenge for the long foreseeable future. But if we can uh, coordinate all of our efforts, I think we can put chemical manufacturing in the same footing as aer aer aerospace or <coughs> automotive or computer technologies. So the enabling technologies that allow us to do this are the advanced simulation, which is going to be a key part, but advanced measurements, the ability to measure things in a tiniest scale in greatest detail, and advanced manufacturing. If you can imagine, you can manufacture the parts, no matter how complicated they are. These provide the uh, footwork for us to dream and think in terms of new innovations and in process equipment design. So that is the dream of building a digital twin for every process that will allow us to, uh, in silico, think of, imagine different designs, alternate designs. And it is going to be a long path, there is no doubt about it, but the time is right and the tools are there so we should train the next generation of students to be able to achieve that. 
And in one of the first uh, epic seminars, um, Ian Figar from UBC, he did his PhD at Oxford. So he shared a story. So he started the seminar uh, because we called ours enabling process innovation through computation. And his quotation was, when computation starts, thinking stops. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it was kind of a challenge. And uh, I would conclude by this time, I guess, uh, by saying that uh, thinking uh, itself can be aided by computation through artificial intelligence, that's where we are. And uh, Matthias, that was organized by uh, uh, Philippe in the TOTA, is, Matthias, I guess, stands for Math, Artificial Intelligence, and Statistics, I believe, right? So, um, in, incorporates ideas from artificial intelligence, how we can use that to uh, achieve or enable uh, advanced modeling and advanced innovation. Uh, Maya, you need to watch out and tell me. Sure. Time is okay. So this is NNMI. NNMI is a concept that was proposed from the White House to reintegrate manufacturing in the United States, and uh, their goal is to uh, announce about 15 uh, such NNMIs, and they have announced already eight or so in different areas that you can see. The one that we are currently competing and awaiting the result is on process intensification by the Department of Energy. The, the, the goal of achieving energy efficiency in the way that we operate these plants. So that means understanding the process operations and uh, improve their performance through existing retrofits as well as in future uh, designs. <coughs> and chemical industry, I think uh, you all know there are about 10,000 chemical companies in the U.S. producing about 70,000 uh, chemical products from detergents, from uh, pesticides, from uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, chemicals, etc. And it has a huge impact on the, uh, on the nation and on the world. So the global chemical market, for example, has grown by 127 percent to about 5.3 trillion dollars. It's really a huge industry. Uh, U.S. chemical shipment has dropped in the period from 13 to 15 percent. The global footprint. So what is happening? The globalization, the manufacturing moving to other countries. But performance chemicals and specialty chemicals are still being uh, manufactured uh, here, and that's where the uh, highest value in the value chain is in terms of the property. So it is a big industry and there are great opportunities, but as I think Dr. Wilson had pointed out, it's an industry that's not moving as rapidly in terms of innovation as other industries of automotive, aerospace, and uh, computer space examples. Uh, by sector, I guess you have basic chemicals, specialty chemicals, agricultural chemicals, pharma, consumer chemicals. So it is truly broad. Every product that you touch and you wake up from the toothpaste is manufactured in a chemical manufacturing plant. So it's really huge. And this is how our current <coughs> network has evolved. Started from EPIC and moved to so-called PIQ. Uh, it consists of about 20 universities, about uh, 42 partner companies, and four national labs. There is truly a national effort, and Arthur gave me an idea of how we are organizing this. Uh, and that has been a wonderful experience. So this is the basic concept of how EPIC works. Advancing the fundamental science of multi-phase, multi-scale, multi -phase processes. That takes place primarily in universities. And using the enabling technologies of modeling, measurement, and manufacturing, come up with new technologies. Chemical engineers, you know there are 70,000 products or so that are made, basically depends on a few fundamental unit operations. Okay, these are separation of species that are mixed, mixing of species that are separated, and converting species from one or molecule to another molecule. So reaction, separation, mixing, other technologies. And so we want to innovate that space to produce sustainable, environmentally friendly processes for the future, taking natural resources, so this is a knowledge base on which we are building this, and taking natural resources that come from minerals and some uh, fossil fuels, <coughs> water as part of an important raw material, and converting into useful products, and recycling both products and uh, so this example basically shows what are the challenges in terms of uh, uh, innovations in the chemical industry. So you see tremendous uh, improvement in automotive, aerospace, and particular industries in terms of innovation, rapid innovation cycle. But to build a plant like that, it literally requires millions of dollars, and you're not going to throw it every two years, just like you can throw a cell phone and buy a new one, right? So there are challenges in terms of uh, capital cost requirement. So the modular manufacturing is one approach to uh, enable uh, a, a rapid uh, innovation cycle <coughs> injected into the space. 
And the other part is the complex physics, the multiple physics. So this is an equipment where two phases are being mixed to achieve a separation of species. So this is the ideal regime that we would like to achieve. And there are millions of droplets. Similarly, in two days, there are millions of particles. So the question is, do we want to understand where they are every time, or do we want to understand uh, at the right scale? And that is the challenge. So currently, we assume everything to be homogeneous, <coughs> and Aspen, ISIS type of simulators, or on that scale, a very large scale. And uh, we need to go down at the appropriate scale to be able to develop a appropriate model that will allow us to scale up and explore the design space in a more systematic manner. So the challenges are in multiple flow, and the challenges are in introduced chemical reactions. Okay, so if you can understand and make progress on these two, we can make a significant process in developing the next generation of plants. So these are examples of the various chemical plants, the bubble column, uh, a fluidized milk reactor, an agitated slurry reactor. So we are injecting energy into these to achieve some purpose. In this case, it's essentially potential energy. Um, in this case, it's kinetic energy. And here it is, uh, sorry, in this case, it's a gravitational force, so potential energy. Here it is pressure energy. We are injecting pressure, uh, energy in the form of the pressure to develop some kind of mixing between uh, the two phases to achieve a reaction or a separation. And uh, how do we design these currently? <coughs> do certain experiments, develop some empirical calculations, and use that in the hope that they will be scale invariant to design cloud scale plants. And these are significantly affected by the complex way dynamics that take place inside the cells. So our challenge is really to replace these with the next generation of models that will capture the physics at the right scale so that we can use that to design, uh, explore a uh, larger design space of that. Uh, so this is an example that Professor mm -hmm. David Joshi uh, gave in his first talk, I think, in his uh, workshop a few years ago. Basically, he plots the 20 different correlations that have been published in the literature on a bubble column, mm -hmm. trying to predict what the gas holder is. And what you see here is a complete standard, but it doesn't mean that each one of the work is useless. They are correct for the range that they have studied. One was measured in a 4-inch column, the other one was measured in a maybe 12-inch column. But as you increase the size, the flow pattern changes completely. And that uh, affects the overall gas holdup. And gas holdup is a very critical parameter in the design of the columns. So we want to introduce models that will capture the large scale structures, the mesoscale scale structures, and to capture the dynamics of individual bubbles for mass transfer, heat transfer, etc., so that we can develop a different alternate set of correlations that are embedded into the simulation environment. And that will call for mixing physics-based models with data-based models. And that is the key vision that I want to share with you. And maybe I'll just go to that particular uh, slide. So this is the vision that we have proposed in the INMI for the so-called digital twins or the virtual test. So here you have a column of models that are physics-based, trying to understand the physics and chemistry of the processes, a column for trying to understand data-enabled models. We have a presentation this afternoon from IBM that will allow us to incorporate those coupled with the physics-based models. And we have, of course, an optimization loop for the design that produces newer designs. And uh, we take the data from the performance from laboratory experiments and compare the two and feed that. So we want to develop an open architecture where we will share these data and models in an open way um, that can be used by the entire community to it go through this iteration of coming up with new uh, generation of design or retrofitting existing ones to improve their performance. Because of the uncertainties, existing plant uh, units typically have an excess capacity because we just are not sure of how design procedure will assume a fetch factor and increase it by 50% or so. So if you can understand and manage the phase distribution inside that, there is room for extracting more out of the existing uh, plants. And the next generation plants can be modular and compact and more energy efficient. So this is our big picture on how we want to build an open architecture-based environment for constructing a digital twin for every process unit. And this will be done uh, from CCT, from uh, LSU, for example. Uh, so uh, there's a quotation that I always point out that is essentially all models are wrong, <coughs> some models are useful. So in all, building all these models, there's always a tremendous amount of uncertainty, so they need to understand what the uncertainties are and how to manage them. So this afternoon, again, we have some industrial presentations that show even though these models are approximate, 
we can still help in improving the design and performance that saves millions of dollars uh, in the current context uh, to the companies. Uh, this is one example of a uh, uh, model effort that we have taken. Uh, essentially, it's a direct numerical simulation of fluid particle interactions. We get to do sweating flows, fluid etc. But these are fully resolved models. The most sophisticated continuum based models that one can develop. And we have been working on some algorithms, but there are a number of others that we have been working on also. So, how do we come together to generate data? That data can then be used to build mesoscale models from the fundamental state model. I'll so just give you a few examples of what happens when we have two spheres, for example, that are settling. And we can look at the interaction, predict the drag, etc., and go from two to easily uh, 100 and easily thousands of particles. So we can extract information because these are all fully resolved simulations uh, on the black coefficient distribution, etc. So we extend this, then this is the most recent work that has come from one of our group on mass transfer. So this is mass transfer in the fact column. So where we look at that in, in detail the flow velocity and the mass transfer coefficient, the distribution of mass transfer coefficient, etc. Then building on the data analytics on this, because we have now on every particle what is the mass transfer coefficient, which is never done uh, in the past. So using that data, we can then build, for example, what is the distribution, probability distribution of the mass transfer coefficient for a particular column. So if this statistics remains invariant, then we can take this and apply it to larger and larger columns. And that is the path that we, we, we envision for putting robustness into our model. So the last question that I posed about uh, how, what about the computation. So here is a graph that I came across which points out, over a period of time, what happened to manufacturing. Okay? About uh, 1,000, 2,000 years ago, 98% of the population was engaged in food production. As food production became most uh, efficient, that number went down, but manufacturing number went up. People employed in manufacturing. Now, that is beginning to come down. Okay? What is happening? Because manufacturing is being automated. So that releases people's time to do other things, and those are all currently in terms of computers. And there's a very nice TED talk that talked about impact of productivity on machine learning. Okay. So essentially with muscle power, when we replaced muscle power with machines, we saw a small bump in the productivity. Okay, but with machine learning, we expect the productivity to go like that. And uh, this graph shows where we are currently. And the prediction is very soon, computers will become smarter than human beings in doing a lot of these uh, routine design explorations and if that happens, then we can actually compute to continue to think about these problems and bring in innovation to the industry. With that, I guess I will uh, stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Professor Vijay Kanadi. I have known him for uh, almost 30 years, more than that. Um, I, of course, all of you also know because um, uh, he has several books, he's the editor of several journals, and uh, he's launched a couple of companies, very successful companies. And uh, the, the, the person from their company, Triagonal, has actually come and participated in a workshop in the past. So he's a scholar, a teacher, an entrepreneur. Uh, he has been the Deputy Director, I think, of the National Chemical Lab in India for a long time. Um, but recently, last summer, he moved from there to uh, Queen's University in Belfast. And um, it was uh, fortunate for us to catch him as he was flying back from the ANCH meeting back to um, uh, Queen's University. So I'm really very thankful and grateful for him to come and uh, give this keynote presentation. He was one of the participants in the uh, Workshop in fact, and uh, so, uh, but this talk is going to be a different. I'm um, looking forward to that. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Thank you, Kumar. Thank you. Thank you. Kumar. It's really a pleasure to be here at Epic Conference, Epic Workshop. But as Kumar said, I must caution you that I'm not going to focus on computations. I've been working and using computations for process intensification right from the beginning of my research career, right from my PhD days. 
I in fact founded a company which was specifically focused is, is specifically focused on using computations, which is called as tridiagonal solutions. And many of you know that tridiagonal matrix is encountered in many computations. So I was leading that company for a couple of years as CEO, and when I was doing that, I realized that I think there is still a lot more beyond computations to process innovations. And in fact, I quote one of my friends uh, told me that. The difference between chemistry and physics, once you understand chemistry, it becomes physics. <laughs> and there are there's so many things which we still do not understand. So there are still chemistry and catalysis still make very, very significant impact on process innovations. So I thought that we need to, or I need to focus more on things beyond computations. Of course, computations are really force multipliers. I still use computations for all my, all my work. But there are things beyond computations, and that is what I'm going to focus today on. So I, in fact, returned back to my lab, National Chemical Lab, and started looking at and conceived this project, which we call it as Indus Magic. So we know it, develop, and upscale magic processes. So magic stands here for modular, agile, intensified, and continuous. So I'm essentially going to tell you what we have been doing for the last four or five years on this Indus Magic program. It's beyond computations. So what I'll do is I'll just briefly touch upon what are the requirements of uh, finance specialty chemicals industry. I'm going to focus on finance specialty chemical industry because most of the intricate chemistries happen. <coughs> so when, when Kumar said that when we get up in the morning and use toothpaste to till we sleep, we use so many different products which involves different chemicals and materials involving a lot more complicated chemistry. So that is what I am going to focus on and of course tell you what we have done in the last few years. So I will not spend a lot of time, I think many of you are already familiar with how useful chemical industry is and what kind of products we make. Just some of the uh, uh, statistics is probably related to Indian finance, finance specialty chemical industries. Typically in India it grows almost twice uh, that of GDP growth. Because a lot more products which were available in India, a lot more new products are being introduced in that kind of market. Unfortunately, most of the capacity of this finance specialty chemicals is significantly orders of magnitude smaller than large chemical plants, right? Bulk chemicals or petrochemicals and refineries, right? So typically, typical capacities which we are looking at is less than 100,000 tons per year, 50,000 tons per year, 10,000 tons per year, that kind of specialty and fine products which we are talking about. So how do we really look at the innovations? And these industry itself, I mean each factory, each plant may be less than 100,000 ton per annum, but first of all these products are much high value than say for example fuels and there are so many manufacturers of this. So typically in India for example, we have more than 100,000 small chemical manufacturers which are engaged into, and into this manufacturing of finance specialty chemicals. And that is where chemistry is, and catalysis is very, very important, which is, in fact, some of, some of those aspects are still beyond our computation. So what we are essentially, uh, when we started looking at this problem, particularly finance specialty chemicals, how do we improve these processes, how do we improve the performance of these, productivity of these processes, we thought that it's important that apart from course, computational modeling, simulation and visualization, which were kind of my comfort zone at that point of time, we need to expand that and include a lot many other things beyond computations. Right? If, if we want to really develop modular, agile, intensified and continuous processes. So that was the driver. This is my lab which I used to work more, I work more than 26 years here in CL and most of the work which I am showing you today we have done in this lab. Okay, have changed, but that was the project which we have formulated. Five different laboratories. Uh, this lab belongs to a parent organization called CSIR, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, which operates around 40 labs all across India. So this program was conceived by us and five different laboratories were participating in it. And the whole idea was focus is on building magic plants and processes by combining process chemistry, reaction kinetics and engineering and process intensification. 
So lot more computations are used here for designing new devices, but then that has to be combined with chemistry and kinetics, kind of reaction engineering, if you really want to build this magic flux. And we had a lofty goal to magically transform Indian fine and specialty chemical industries. And I'll tell you what we were able to do in those four or five years. And I hope that the journey will continue there when you are not involved directly. So I'll start with one example and then tell you how we try to achieve that. So this is one, uh, one herbicide which is uh, manufactured by at least uh, three to four uh, uh, industries in India. Typically they use uh, batch reactors or semi-batch reactors, a stirred tank reactors. And we converted this into a tubular reactor, very compact modular reactor. So instead of 10 meter cube reactor, 10,000 liter reactor is replaced by 16 liter reactor. It's a magic reactor. So it's more than 500 times reduction in size, 88% reduction in solvent, so 5 times, uh, 6 times reduction in solvent, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a impact was envisaged when we formulated this in this magic program. And how did this magic happen? That is what I am going to talk about. So let me begin at the beginning. So most of the industry, well my friends in the industry get really offended when I show this picture. This is from the famous book of Professor Octave Levinspeed. Right? Alchemists trying to turn lead into gold. But if you really look at finance specialty chemical industry today, well we have much better sophisticated looking agitator, but it is still a vessel and agitation and it's Conceptually, process is still same, right? You add something, it's like a cookbook recipe. Add it, heat it, mix it, cool it, and so on and so forth. So the whole motivation for developing this magic process, modular, agile, intensified, and continuous process is, how can we transform this into sophisticated looking, I mean, Kumar showed in his slide pictures of old car and new car and so on and so forth. Can we transform this into modern looking continuous modular plants. Right? First of all, it should be emphasized that we have been focusing this for Indian chemical industry which was really, really cost conscious. So in fact, you can easily convert this into modern sophisticated looking plant if you have, if you are willing to spend a lot more money. That option was simply not available. So we have to <coughs> convert this into modern looking plant which is safer, which is more productive, more selective, and also less expensive to build and less expensive. Eventually the cost is less than the way it is going. So that is really a, a challenge. So we started thinking about, when we started formulating the project, we started thinking about what we can change in order to really transform this. So I just, uh, I'm, I'm listing here, I'm not going to read uh, this, I'm sure you will get time to read this now. So essentially we try to identify what are the key ways of the conventional plant which you see here. We want to change and develop the magic plant. So beyond some of the obvious things like continuous process, compact and intensified process, <coughs> better catalyst, catalytic processes, there are a couple of unusual terms than the usual process innovation. For example, India is a water stress country. So we want to specifically emphasis on reducing water footprint. So reduce fresh water requirement and as much as recycle and reuse. So that was also included in the, as a part of magic processes. Another important thing was uh, process control. So many of particularly Indian uh, uh, finance specialty chemicals uh, manufacturing is much less automated compared to its bulk chemicals and petrochemicals counterpart. So we wanted to in fact use some of the concepts like new mobile phones and use wireless different kinds of approach to process control. So that's, that was also included in the process innovation. So water and process control were relatively new <coughs> additional points than the usual conventional process innovation apart. Right. So we started working with, uh, with industry, started uh, understanding their key issues. An idea of what was, we realized that influence and changing the mindset of fine and specialty chemical industries which are tuned to batch or semi-batch processes is one of the key challenges and that was also included as one of the tasks for why we formulated the, the magic, magic program. And another important thing was of course we had to evolve and invent some of the new public-private partnership models because 
many times uh, the risk associated with uh, with new technologies lot more this uh, small and uh, medium scale industries are lot more concerned about those risks uh, because that can completely make or break their break their economics we have to invent also new models of public private partnerships and more importantly i would say two things chemists and chemical engineers had to work together really because lot many chemistries used by this finance specialty chemical industries are still not completely understood still not even defined some unknown reactions still occur while you make these products so we need to it's important to bring this two together and most importantly students and industry practitioners because just bunch of 10 15 scientists working in national labs are not going to really change the manufacturing scenario so I, our idea was to include large number of students who will eventually work in the industry and and, and really make a change so let's probably skip this i just what when when i speak to a mixed audience of chemistry and chemical engineers i usually like to show these slides that they have you know stereotypes of chemists and chemical engineers which i have borrowed from this article and we want to in fact fuse this for our magic tape right so whole approach of how chemists look at the problem and how chemical engineer looks at the problem we need to in fact change those mindsets and evolve new kind of magic mindset by looking at process innovation and process uh, uh, integration so this is the framework we established in order to realize our dream of developing magic processes and plants so we had we have this about 20 <coughs> scientists from five different laboratories working as a indus magic scientist team and their students we developed industry consortium on process Uh, intensification based on annual subscription, which is quite similar to what your APIC consortium is, and we also built a student program, inter scholar program, where most of the final year chemical engineering students and masters in process chemistry students were participating. In. So this was the funnel. So these students were actually used for initial screening of ideas, promising looking ideas were taken up by PhD students and the scientists, and those were continuously vetted with the industry members. and eventually resulted in licensing and commercialization which i'm going to speak to you about and most of the project was uh, managed through great portal and so on yeah. so let me begin again what were the drivers for magic processes so what were the targets so essentially we were looking at those chemistries used by fine and specialty chemical industries And taking a fresh look at them essentially identifying how do we reduce material cost how do we improve the selectivity how do we improve the conversion so that conversion costs are less how do we reduce capex how do we reduce time for commercialization these are mainly device oriented or react equipment oriented innovations how do we reduce process complexity which is which has direct impact on product quality how do we build inherently safe operations and of course reduce environmental footprint so these eight drivers were consciously used every time when we look at any chemistry we started thinking about how do we improve this eight aspects of that chemistry so that we can build different kind of completely different kind of plant plant for that and obviously it involves as i said chemistry chemical engineering and of course fluid dynamics because any time when you talk about process intensification process intensification can occur either you improve intrinsic chemical rate reaction rate or you improve the transport processes like kumar was mentioning heat transfer mass transfer so fluid dynamics is of course involved in all of this so we use reaction engineering new concepts of designs for process equipment that is again fluid dynamics is important because all these designs we wanted to ensure that materials and energy are delivered at right time and at right place all the inefficiencies of any process are because materials and energies are not delivered or not taken away at right time and at right place right so that was that was our approach so of course there were issues beyond reactions especially when you are developing compact and intensified reactors you can have channel sizes which are quite small which can in fact lead to clogging erosion corrosion we need to look at some of these aspects which are beyond uh, traditional reaction issues particularly if you want to translate these into practice so i'm going to now show you some examples of how we have been 
uh, using this concept for realizing uh, 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 realizing change in practice. So some of the slides may look say relatively mundane to chemical engineers. We, we, we use classical chemical reaction engineering. So typically, this is again uh, borrowed from uh, published literature, scientific or that some of these can be uh, found in your textbook. So typically, many of these fine and specialty chemical reactions will have multiple reactions. So selectivity is an issue. So you need to understand activation energies and concentration impact and determine what is an ideal way of and carrying out this reaction. So typically, for example, if there is two reactions, if P going to Q going to R, and Q is the desired product, you need can manipulate your temperature and concentration profiles of the reacting systems in such a way that you can maximize selectivity towards Q, so that your material conservation is good, conversion costs are low, so on and so forth. So it's like a classical chemical reaction engineering. Now, once you identify what is the, what is an ideal way to contact, what is an ideal way to have temperature profile and concentration profile, you need to use fluid dynamics to realize that ideal way in practice. So that is the approach we, we follow. So instead of stirred tank reactor, we decided that we will build topologically tubular reactors. Tubular reactors essentially allow you to really use small characteristic size that can give you a lot more better heat and mass transfer characteristics. And that is what we did. The key problem in uh, using small or narrow channel reactors is flow in those narrow channels becomes laminar. And there are several other issues of heat transfer as well as uh, residence time distribution in the, in the channels. Right? So we really had to rethink about uh, how kind, what kind of tube, tubular reactors we are going to use. In Europe, there's a, there was a lot of interest on developing micro reactors. So they were really using really small channel, like 20 micron channel reactors, 50 micron channel reactors. Those reactors were very expensive to build because they require very sophisticated fabrication techniques. And though they offered uh, uh, good control of residence time distribution, their cost to benefit ratio was not favorable uh, for, for, for finance, many of the finance specialty chemical industry. That is why the, the uptake was not, not really good. So what we decided was to use commercial tubings kind of thing. So we, instead of using micro reactors, we decided to use and develop milli reactors, so millimeter scale reactors, and did innovate around that. So in fact, Pablo <coughs> mentioned in his book that uh, Pablo Picasso's reactor, and we in fact built very, very similar reactor, which we call as a pinch tube reactor, which I'm going to show you uh, in, a, in a minute. So what we did was essentially, can we take commercially available tubes and innovate so that we can get rid of their disadvantages of broad residence time distribution and still retain excellent heat and mass transfer characteristics. So again, I'm not going to go through all of these details. We critically looked at what are the different ways by which people have been using enhancements in tubular reactors. These include passive as well as active augmentation. We decided to use passive augmentation and use our computational fluid dynamics background to come up with different shapes. So we examined variety of shapes and in fact we have filed several patents on it. One of the very simple idea which I want to highlight here is was using like a pinch tube. So we actually took commercial tubes and just pinched at different angles at different uh, distance from each other. And this simple idea of this <coughs> pinching can improve your heat and mass transfer very, very significantly and can give you a very narrow residence time distribution. So we have published papers on this and we have also filed patents on this. So besides this commercial tube, we have also developed kind of a small channel reactors. <coughs> Anyone who is familiar with Corning reactors, which are one of the commercial reactors now, they have developed it in glass. We could actually use our computational fluid dynamics, again, uh, experience to come up with idea and found a sweet spot which was not protected by other patents. So we, we had a freedom to practice to create that and it still gave us significantly good heat and mass transfer for batteries. And both of these in fact have been commercially <coughs> licensed to do in the manufacture. So this is kind of a, I, I thought I'll leave, since I'm giving a talk at APIC, I should at least show one slide on CFD simulation results. I have been doing these for several years, so this is just one one example of how we use computations for 
improving this. So essentially, these uh, dimensions of uh, these reactors were optimized using computational fluid dynamics, and similarly, this pinching was also what kind of shape we want to take was optimized using the, the computational fluid dynamics. So this is kind of a reactors. So essentially, when we started thinking about uh, process innovations, we thought that. First of all, we start with reactors and then marry these reactors with different chemistries which we want to improve. So we in fact started looking at variety of uh, chemistries and we as a group of this 2022 scientists, we looked at variety of chemistries. Nitrations and disodizations are one of the common reactions. Sulfoxidations, aminations, hydrogenations, these are the key reactions which we looked at specifically targeted to variety of specialty in chemical manufacturing uh, industry. I must point out that beyond reactions, there are again several uh, aspects which are uh, essential if you really want to develop complete end-to-end -end magic processes. Many of these products of final specialty chemicals are eventually sold in a solid form. So these are not liquid form, solid form. So crystallization, filtration and drying. So this is different kind of CFD which we had to work on. So instead of computational fluid dynamics, we were also focusing on different CFD, crystallization, filtration and drying. And then of course I mentioned to you water treatment and continue. So I'm just going to flash now uh, example. I'll, I'll show you a few slides on one example and then just flash uh, one slide each on different examples before I, I, I make my uh, remark. I want to show one, one example, little more detail, just to emphasize the importance of chemistry in uh, realizing this process innovation. So nitrations, again, nitrations are used in variety of different uh, uh, final specialty chemical manufacturing. Several uh, nitrating agents are used. Most commonly used nitrating uh, agent is mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And that mixed acid, use of mixed acid creates a lot of waste lot of inorganic solids eventually because you need to neutralize this, uh, these acids before you separate your products. And we in fact developed processes mainly using only fuming nitric acid. So we get rid of, we got rid of use of mixed acids. We use only fuming nitric acid that substantially reduced environmental burden as well as we could actually operate these into very different process window than the conventional batch nitration and could realize significant, significant productivity enhancement. Right? So what is the typical procedure involved? Started looking at chemistries, right? did laboratory, small laboratory continuous experiments, understood the safety aspects of this. Remember that most of these nitro compounds are explosive and hazardous, so you need to make sure that you, you come up with the same operations and then use computational reaction engineering models as well as uh, chemical reaction engineering model as well as computational fluid dynamic models to come up with optimum temperature and concentration profiles <coughs> as well as scale up or we call it as numbering up. Right? So just one example of, of, uh, of this just to give you a flavor of what it involved. So started looking at uh, nitration reactions. So it happens with variety of steps. So as I said conventional ways use nitric acid and sulfuric acid, create nitronium ion. This nitronium ion attacks the organic entity and eventually forms. Uh, so this is a kind of simple reaction of nitrobenzene. That involves different states and it is important to understand what is a rate limiting, rate limiting state if you want to really intensify this reaction. Right? <coughs> so if, I, if you take say benzaldehyde and take benzaldehyde nitration, you can end up with four different um, uh, products. In fact, five different products. You can also do the oxidation of benzaldehyde to benzoic acid uh, under nitrating condition. Nitric acid is also one of the oxidizing agents. So when you are doing competition, the only reason why I showed the show this slide is this also is kind of a lump thing. I'm not including all the intermediate steps into it. But unless you understand this chemistry, mere computations will remain sterile. They will not really connect with the reality. That is the point I want to emphasize here to this APIC audience. So it's important to understand this chemistry and then understand intermediate steps to really identify what is my desired product and how do, we, how do I improve that selectivity of desired product. And that is the reason where chemical engineers and computing scientists need to work very closely with chemists who understand this chemistry in a better way than people like us. 
right? So once we once we understand this chemistry, we in fact design small scale experiments. So these are like very simple experiments. This is like one by sixteen inch coil, just tea mixture of benzaldehyde and fuming nitric acid, and we could actually sample it. So in a very very short time, we can generate large amount of data, which can be used for building classical reaction engineering models. So I'm just running this very fast to it because I think all of you are familiar with how do we conduct these chemical chemical experiments and how do we derive chemical kinetics from it. Now, <clears throat> early part of Uh, my career when i was more focused on computation computations i i would have seriously concerned about kind of disagreements which you see here and i would have worked with my students saying that you need to spend lot more time on figuring out what is happening here and many times what is what we really need to do is particularly for complex chemistries as an engineer we need to decide cost to benefit ratio and what is a simple model and what is a simpler model is always a concern for any any uh, engineer right it is important to take that judgment before you really spend uh, uh, unnecessary uh, time and resources for refining those models because your here our purpose is not really to describe this reactions appropriately the purpose of all this exercise was to intensify those reactions right so you need to draw a right line between simple and simpler of course you don't want to make over simplify the things and that is in fact the judgment which you have to develop and cultivate by working with chemists and uh, other scientists beyond beyond computation because this kind of uh, uncertainties are what more connected to this chemistry and, and the approximations which you made in this pumping these chemical reactions but we use these models then we use in fact classical Uh, CFD models to understand dispersion. So typically, we don't want to use thousands of one by sixteen inch tubes, which we did it in a laboratory, right? So when we want to commercialize this reactor, we want to use a combination of numbering up and scaling up. So instead of thousands of one by sixteen inch tube, it is it may be better to use say uh, tens of one by four inch tube or one by one half inch tube, right? So in, in that case, we need to understand. how the dispersion and mixing changes with scale and how hot spots can change right so typically in a in a tube these tubes are immersed in a coolant so your wall temperature is what you can control from outside because these reactions are isothermic as you increase uh, as you start using larger and larger tubes your hot spot can go up and you need to be careful about this even the hottest temperature within the reactor is Uh, within the safe limit right and that is why we need to combine then computational fluid dynamics and ci models but once you do that so understand chemistry understand impact of uh, fluid dynamics and heat transfer on that and then come up with a optimum solution right so this is kind of a solution again instead of a large uh, uh, stirred tank reactor where lot of this Uh, 10 tons of, for example, nitrating mixture and nitrating compound sitting there, which is really intrinsically unsafe. We could actually reduce the size. Again, this is like a, as I said, 10 to 20 liter reactor. Physical dimensions are these are coils inside, so this is typically one feet in diameter and about six feet in height. So that's kind of a size which is replaced. This reactor is replacing that large reactor, and inventory here is like 10 kgs. so instead of sitting 10 tons of explosive material in the plant now you have only 10 kgs of explosive material which is residing in the in the reactor so it's a really significant order of magnitude intensification it's much more safer to operate operating this right there are of course two three things here we have used in fact combination of pitch tube and helical tube this is essentially built basing using 14 inch and 1/2 feet so initial section where reaction occurs really fast we use quarter inch tubing with a pinching and later on we use in fact we can we could use a uh, one half inch tubing so we essentially took commercial tubes so the cost of manufacturing of this reactor is again orders of magnitude lower than any other micro reactors or, or other uh, systems right and several systems have already uh, implemented in the commercial scale of this and we will show you this <coughs> So I'm just going to flash few examples now. No, I, I don't need to spend time uh, uh, on 
this again and again. There are a couple of other uh, xylenes again, uh, nitrations again, so orthoxylene, xylenes. So nitration of orthoxylene used for, say, fibric brightener. There are several applications of, of these uh, compounds in the final specialty chemical industry. And I'm, I'm showing you here what kind of performances uh, we could improve. So typically these nitrations are run at very uh, low temperatures. We could actually ramp up the temperature. That is the reason why, why our reactor size is so small. Instead of 10 meter cube, it is 10 liter. Because my reaction now is very fast. I can run this reaction at that rate because my heat transfer is a lot more than what we had in stirred type reactor. Right? So that is, the, that is the advantage of doing this. So these are kind of impacts which we could realize in practice. Well, I'm going to flash a few slides. Uh, all of these chemistries, I mean, my purpose here is not to tell you about the chemistries, but just to tell you that we have been using similar approach and came up with variety of uh, uh, products, variety of processes, uh, uh, which we, we could intensify in, in a continuous reactor. Not just we improved the raw material consumption norms, I mean, that is another way we could improve selectivity substantially. We also could, in fact, because of the improved selectivity, the final quality of the product was also much better than what we get in otherwise batch or semi-batch reactor. If you are using that stirred tank reactor, your residence time is very high and a lot more byproducts and unwanted reactions happen in stirred tank reactor, which you can completely eliminate with the short residence time tubular reactors. Right. So this, uh, many of these have been then, first we did this proof of concept studies using the funds given by the funding agency. So that kind of model which we developed, so instead of asking immediately the upfront uh, funds from the industry, we could actually use uh, government uh, funding agencies money to create this proof of concepts on the laboratory scale. And once the concept is proven on the laboratory scale, we actually sign bilateral projects with industry, which were then given to those specific industries. And then that is the way we transferred these processes and know-how to industries. I'm just flashing some of those uh, different reactions with me on that. So as I said, at the end of it, most of the times, the successful proof of concept will resulted in a bilateral project and a technology transfer. This is another example of guys. In fact, the batch reactor, uh, the, the manufacturer was constrained in making one particular grade. With continuous reactor, with our better manipulation of residence time, the product basket was significantly improved. So this was for a yellow dye manufacturer and we can actually cleverly tweak the color and create a different different products. So <coughs> the manufacturer, the industry could actually differentiate and launch new products of yellow color because of the batch to continuous transformation. So that's just one point I wanted to highlight. Well, I, mean, I don't, need, don't need to go through all of, all of these presentations. Uh, one point I want to highlight here, this was the proof of concept again, it's a very different kind of uh, proof of concept, a lot more fluid mechanics was used here. This is a classic process of, by Allen Croft, this is a nitrobenzene and para is used to make paraminophenol. Paraminophenol is, uh, is a penultimate stage to paracetamol, which is a very common drug. Right? <coughs> so, currently, in India, people make uh, para aminophenol even in China by para nitro uh, benzene, para chloro nitro benzene, ENCP hydrogenation, which generates a lot of waste. So we came up and developed this process. We innovated this old process of Malian crop, which was operated in batch at high pressure. We actually pushed this in a boiling reactor regime. So we raised the temperature and we could actually remove heat by a very clever way of running this in the boiling reactor regime. So we improved selectivity and really compacted. So this has been licensed to an Indian manufacturer. Plant is being built. So almost $100 million investment part is being built for 30,000 ton per annum of this paracetamol, uh, the paracetamol product, which is about a penultimate scale of, of paracetamol. So many of our finance specialty chemical industries uh, owners, Many of the industries are in family owned in India, this finance specialty chemical industry. They were very skeptical about these continuous processes. They had never operated <coughs> continuous plants. So we decided that we build a demo plant of uh, uh, bench scale plants of these uh, 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 continuous plants at our lab. 
So this was the lab which we saw, we established. So we renovated part of our pilot plant and developed this magic lab. But this was inaugurated. This is our science and technology minister, which, which inaugurated this lab. And we had significant. Uh, so these are kind of statistics. So we have a tall process area, short process area of more than 4,000 feet uh, square feet. Analytical lab associated with it, wet lab, storage, islands, and so on and so forth. So we have really state of the art equipment there, including some of those uh, pilot scale, white film evaporators. This is a typical uh, reaction bay. This is a setup which we have developed a process which we are again uh, licensing it to one of the companies for high methyl carbonate. We use again a tubular helical tube reactor. So these are kind of uh, reaction modular systems which we built. So this is kind of a demo to convince our skeptical industry friends that yes, batch and semi-batch processes can be translated into continuous processes. We could actually show them the products which they can actually give it to their potential customer to ensure that product quality is acceptable and that is the way we could actually help uh, licensing some of our, our processes. Right? So I'll just flash to last uh, few slides. Uh, Besides process, of course, we need to do many other things, right? And uh, yeah. so these are kind of a photographs which we have licensed. So those ideas of pitch tube and topologically tubular reactors, which we were, were able to patent, we were licensed to a company called Our Equipment Company. They used to make stirred tanks, so we could convince their owner to make get into these new types of reactors. And these are kind of commercial reactors which which Amar makes. These are typically metallic reactors. We also developed glass line reactors because many of these fine and specialty chemicals are also uh, corrosive materials and many times those reactions are done in a glass line stirred tank. So in order to replace, replace those glass line stirred tanks, we came up with glass line tubular reactors and these were developed in collaboration with GMM Fogler, which is again the largest glass line stirred tank manufacturer in India and they worked with us to come up with this. This is a large scale module and this is like a and we of course did a lot of work on crystallization, filtration and drying. I probably don't have time to talk about it and probably that is not really directly connected to our, our workshop here. But we did those again here. Most of the times in industry crystallizers are used in a batch or semi-batch mode. We developed the continuous, uh, continuous crystallizer. So this is like a horizontal stirred tank reactor multi-zonal system. We worked with a company called Technoforce and we came up with ideas and models. <coughs> Computational models play a lot more role here in getting the control on particle size distribution so that we in fact build those models. How do we estimate the kinetics? How do we combine population balance models with computational fluid dynamics models along with the particle shape models so that we can build the integrated tools for for crystallizers. Right? <coughs> and then of course Separations, as Kumar mentioned, separations is one of the key components. Again, there we develop new devices and new approaches for intensifying separations. I'm just giving you one example of liquid-liquid extraction columns. Many of these nitrations and diazonizations I talked about, these are actually two liquid phases which we intense, intensely mix. We need to, in fact, do the product purification by liquid-liquid extraction, and we use, in fact, annular centrifugal extractor and other compounds, other process equipment. I don't have probably time to talk about uh, about the uh, water recycle and reuse, but we came up with this book recently, and this gives all our uh, these documents, all our efforts, significant uh, efforts, which we are also in fact resulted in a spin out company. We also work with another spin out company, not done by our team members, but done by a few students of uh, IIT Mumbai, and uh, they essentially helped us to really use this wireless sensing and control. Again, probably I don't have time now. The key idea is commercial companies, Honeywell, etc., they of course offer wireless sensors and control, but they operate on completely different methodology. They have developed new types of sensors which has integrated wireless communication facility. What we have come up idea here is we use with conventional sensors and develop an add-on module so that most of the Small chemical manufacturers can actually adapt this. They cannot afford Honeywell solutions. These are order of magnitude inexpensive compared to large companies' uh, solutions. So we work. So this company, the startup company which I mentioned about wireless sensing and control, was founded by IIT Mumbai alumni. We work closely with that. 
This is one of our team members have founded uh, Vivira. This Vivira is focusing on, on the cavitation which I mentioned to you on, on, on here. In fact, I am a co-founder of Vivira. So unlike my previous company which was specifically focusing on computations, we hope that Vivira process technologies can go beyond computation and do some of the process innovations which are, which are there. So just to summarize, just to give you a flavor of what, what this program resulted in for this uh, 2011 to 2016, typically five years. Apart from the output, we published significant number of papers. We were actually close to 50 disclosures uh, by now. We came up with two books which evolved out of the workshops uh, conducted in this, uh, in this uh, program. So one was an industrial wastewater treatment, recycling and reuse. Other came recently, this, this April, industrial catalytic processes for fine and specialty chemicals. We also came up with a process intensification a special issue in Indian chemical engineer. We developed more than 50 lap scale processes, typically 54 or 55 uh, lap scale processes, which are like a proof of concept and created process notes. Many of these have resulted in bilateral projects. Right? We trained more than 100 students and project fellows, trained more than 500 chemists and chemical engineers from, from industries. We conducted 10 workshops and we touched more than 200 uh, micro, small or medium scale industries in fine industrial industries. So this is kind of an output. On an outcome side, some of these processes are already licensed uh, to, to industries. So these are some of those industries which are already commercialized our uh, uh, processes. Vivira also has licensed the cavitation patent of, of, for a pure treatment. These are some of the pro, uh, uh, other collaborators. So as I said, we could actually license within, before even the project ended, we could license around 10 processes plus come out with one spin-out company. That's kind of a output the outcome we get out of this project. So just to summarize, the next <coughs> wave of productivity improvement, next really innovations in fine and specialty chemicals industry. I believe that magic will play significant role, the modular, agile, intensified and continuous. If you can use this magic approach and concept, it will have large potential not just to fine and specialty chemical industry in India, but also anywhere in the world, including now I am getting more and more connect with European fine and specialty chemical industry and I believe that uh, they, they are quite receptive to some of these ideas. They have been toying with uh, micro reactor concepts, and there is an appeal, significant appeal to this magic idea. And I believe that it has a significant potential, and eventually it will magically transform the way we manufacture fine and special so I think I'll stop here and we'll take your questions.
No, so these are these are different. They, I mean, there are so many Mac micro reactor companies. Each is targeting different applications. The one which comes closest to us is probably Corning because they use milli reactor. Many of the other micro reactors are really tiny channels. So Corning uh, reactor characteristic size is milli reactor. And I hope Corning person is not here, but Corning is <laughs> at least two orders of magnitude more expensive than any of our reactors. Well, let's thank the speaker and we can catch up with him now.